Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, lovely people, and welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast. How are you doing today? It is still a very bright, sunny day in the lovely area of North Yorkshire. Um, we're still within the the COVID isolation currently, and although the new guidelines have come out, I'm still out of work. But we've got a lot of more opportunities to do things like this. Do do a more few more podcasts, do a few more YouTube videos and stuff. And today we're going to be talking about autism and demisexuality. And I'm sure that many people out there will be a little bit confused about the term demisexuality. It is sort of a a sexuality that's that's covered by a, a broad spectrum of asexuality. There's a big sort of ace community around around this that's what they call themselves the aces but today i've i'm joined with yo samdi sam from a very popular youtube channel she does a lot of videos on autism and she's done a video on demisexuality as well so how are you today sam hi i'm doing all right thank you yeah we're we're still sort of partially in in lockdown over here in the netherlands so um yeah, probably about the same as you guys um, over in the UK, just getting a bit sick of it now. <laughs> I understand that. So where, whereabouts are you from in the Netherlands then? Well, I'm British, but um, about, uh, gosh, seven years ago now, uh, we moved moved over to the Netherlands to, uh, that sounds a cliche, start a new life. Not really, but, <laughs> you know, we moved over because we, um, we, we, didn't like living in London anymore for various reasons, and we thought we'd uh, would make a go of it, and uh, and here we are, seven years later. That's very cool. Um, I've always thought about moving over to the Netherlands because one of my good friends from university um, sort of did one of her years abroad in England. We sort of met at um, Manchester Uni, and she lives she lives in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. We went over. To, me and my friend went over to visit her. We sort sort of stayed and and saw the sites and the museums and stuff and it was just it was just such a nice place like it was so quiet like everywhere it was it was clean it was it was really nice well i I wouldn't say that amsterdam is is the most (laughs) quiet city it's 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 rather touristy um and and certain parts of the netherlands are very very densely populated but um it's always kind of a short drive out. You can get to nature, which is really nice. Ah, well, I guess I guess my my experience with the Netherlands has been Amsterdam and Rotterdam, but what, the place that my friend lives is sort of on the the outskirts of the city, so it wasn't it wasn't around the sort of touristy uh, places, which was quite nice. Yeah, it is a very it's a very very chill country, I have to say. Yeah, and the people are very nice as well. I found. I mean, maybe yeah. that's just the uh, the tourist mindset that I had on, but um, they do seem to be quite chilled. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I think the Dutch are a very um, kind of a pragmatic people. You know, sort of no nonsense, um, very direct. Which I it can be good, it can be bad, it can come off a little bit um, abrupt when you are British and you kind of been brought up. Well, I wouldn't say mincing your words, but there's a certain way to sound polite in the UK, right? And that's not how you do it in the in the Netherlands. We don't have any so, of our yeah. delicate sensibilities. <laughs> exactly. It's just get right to the point, you know, say what you think, which is refreshing. But, you know, as, a, as an autistic person, I grew up with one set of rules, the UK way of doing things. So it's been quite hard for me to adjust, even though I appreciate the uh, directness. It's still a bit like, are you sure they're not being rude to me? <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. I, I I spent a little bit of time abroad in in Thailand, and they're, they're sort of known to be the the land of smiles, um, and the the very sort of they, they take politeness to a new level, uh, which 
I think mm. because I'm from like the north of England, obviously the sort of social rules and stuff are a little bit more I guess I guess more more direct and more more to the point and and all that. Whereas in Thailand, you, you're not supposed to talk about certain types of things, and you know it's um, you know like any anything to do with talking about like the kings or the or the royal royalty or they've got a very big culture of respect over there, and I found that quite hard to adjust to. I think. Yeah, I mean, any kind of cultural difference is. Uh... I don't know. On on one hand, I've I've travelled quite a lot, and so I find that I'm quite sort of um, open minded in some ways. But it's it's very hard to actually adjust your own mindset. It's one thing being open minded and respecting people, but then living there or sort of being told to adjust your mindset like that is is something else, and it's actually quite a bit harder mm. than I thought. I suppose there's a difference between sort of going about and being a tourist um, as opposed to actually. Sort of being a part of a community and a new culture, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, there are lots of people who live here who um, just they stay in the expat community, and that's kind of like their bubble. Uh, especially in Amsterdam, because English is an official second language mm. of Amsterdam, the city. So um, you know, I think sixty percent of residents are not wow. Dutch. Sixty percent. Yeah. So exactly. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a there's a very big expat community and a, and it's sort of like an expat bubble in some ways, which is, is sort of good and, and, and bad in a variety of ways. Would you like to give us a little bit of a background into who you are and what you do as a job and a little bit about your YouTube channel? Absolutely. Um, yep. Uh, my, name, so my, name, my, my name is Sam. Um, 30, 34 years old. Every year it takes me a little bit longer to do the maths <laughs> on that one. And uh, yeah, I'm British and moved over to the Netherlands. Um, and so about just over a year ago, I decided to start up a YouTube channel after I was diagnosed with autism uh, when I was mm -hmm. 33. And uh, so basically, I started my YouTube channel kind of as a way to process my diagnosis, because when you get diagnosed later in life, you sort of have to go back over yeah. every memory you've had and and you see it in a different light um so i was kind of the first video that i uploaded was about my diagnosis and kind of like it was very stream of consciousness just me kind of thinking about all the ways that autism has impacted my life and i didn't even realize it um and then so i was doing i, I always just wanted to do a youtube channel because i thought it would be fun to be honest and so i was doing a few videos here and there and then a few months in, I was just getting a really great response to the videos that I did on autism. So I kind of um, doubled down on that. And uh, so it took about like six months before my channel just really started growing. And then last year, I mean, last December, it was just, it was, it was insane. You know, I think I got like 8,000 subscribers in a month or, or something. And so it's just kind of kept on climbing since then, which is, is great. But I mean, it's overwhelming. I can <laughs> And your YouTube channel is currently at 31.3 thousand subscribers and 1.66 oh, yeah. million <laughs> views in total. How many? 1.6. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's sort of like, I, I really like analytics. I'm, I'm a kind of numbers and patterns person, but, uh, sometimes you get very disconnected from, from what that means uh in terms of because i'm still just doing exactly <laughs> the same thing i did when i started you know i make my video every week i put it online it's like nothing's changed but all of a sudden i have you know stadiums of people watching which is it a, is bit, a bit crazy <laughs> isn't it like i mean i can't i can't yeah. empathize ma massively with that i think my i think i think it does get to a point where you you get to a certain level of numbers and it just becomes normalized, I guess. Yeah, and it's also meaningless. It's like, you know, I would get a thousand views and I'm like, okay, but what is that? What is that? Um, so it's it's a very kind of strange um, place to be. You know, it's not like if you have, I don't know, if you're an actor or something and you have a TV show that does well and then people recognize you on the streets. It's, it's kind of different because your life doesn't change that much and yet maybe sometime like I so I post in Facebook groups or something even unrelated to autism and sometimes someone will be like oh my gosh I love your channel 
I'm like, oh shoot, <laughs> I guess I should uh, have a fake uh, Facebook profile yeah. now, shouldn't I? <laughs> so yeah, it's it's weird, and it's also kind of weird because I never really uh, set out for fame. Fame is not something that I'm aggressively pursuing necessarily, um, but it does give me an opportunity to make a difference. And it gives me an opportunity to change the narrative around autism, which I think is the work that's keeping me going because there's only, there's only so much I can keep talking about myself and my experiences mm -hmm. and my diaries from when I was a teenager, you know, it, it's going to get boring. Um, and it's, it's not what's important is, is my journey. My journey is a part of it. It's part of the, the reason why I got here, but, but now that I'm here, it's more like, you know, there are so many things that I want to change in the way that the wider public sees autism and autistic people. And that's not just, it's not just about me. That's about the autistic community or not just the community, but autistic people, autistic adults and children. Yeah, I, I, I completely, I completely get that. Like, I think, I think one of the, um, sort of, sort of the motives of me starting the podcast is I'm, I'm trying to like compile all these um, sort of amazing well amazing people like yourself to be honest and and get everyone together and have a little bit of a discussion on that stuff it's it's very hard to break into the mainstream media about these things as i've experienced recently about sort of promoting my um recent documentary yeah i mean i think people think that autism is just such a minority and not many people are interested in it actually but, you know, I talk to when I talk to people, well, you know, before lockdown, out and about or something, and they say, oh, well, what do you do? And then I explain about the YouTube channel. Everybody I talk to are like, oh, well, my little brother's autistic or I have a cousin who's autistic. Like everybody knows somebody really who's autistic. And so you think, well, why isn't this being shown on on mainstream media? What is it about autism that makes people think that? Um, you know, we should just be ignored when autistic people are some of the strongest, most interesting people around. I think there there is sort of a, a rhetoric in the in the media that autism is all about children and yeah. and pe people in in care and stuff like that. And I think a lot of the stuff that's on TV and a lot of the sort of newscasts are a sort of like either either from a sympathy angle or from a sort of feel good story angle it's never about like just getting people down and chatting um about some of some of the many issues that face the autistic community um and i think the problem with um people like me and i'm i'll make an assumption people like you who are vocal about autism is that we don't fit their their preconceived ideas about autistic people. So that's like, we, we can't be real autistic people. They want to meet real autistic people, you know, yeah. like the ones in care homes. And it's like, okay, we are different for sure. But me talking about autistic experiences, that's not invalidating, that's including. And sure, they have, they have struggles that I don't have. For example, um, you know, being less able to talk maybe fluently, maybe at all. But the the their autistic identity is is still it's still that, and they have needs which are similar, if not exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. So really, I think it's just it's it's a way of silencing autistic voices because well, you're too high functioning. We don't we don't want to talk to someone like you because you don't have any problems. It's diminishing my autism which as i'm starting to the more i talk about it the more i realize how much it has impacted my life my ability to get a job um, my ability to maintain friendships and and things like that so it makes me it makes me pretty angry when when they try to separate into well you are one of the the, the high functioning autistics mm -hmm. and, and these people yeah. they're in they're in a home because it's like okay well what if i hadn't had my husband around to support me in my my 20s when i had you know, my mental health wasn't good in my 20s. If I hadn't had someone like that, I I don't know, I could have ended up in an institution. It's sort of like, well, you know, I'm an atheist, but like, but for the grace of God there, but for the grace of God <laughs> go I, you know, like, I, I could have ended up in different situations. And I really think it was luck and the support 
of the people around me and, and privilege in a lot of ways that's meant that I'm, I'm able now to be seen as high functioning. But that's not my autism isn't high functioning. It's, it's just I'm lucky, I guess. I guess that's the root of it. I think there is definitely a a large aspect of um, sort of growing up in the in the right environment, having supportive people around you, whether it's at home or at school, and also like I think because because of the st- statistics around sort of workplaces and pretty much every single sort of social environment, it it can be hard for autistic people to sort of go through go through those systems without any support i suppose um and i think one of the the main things that i've seen um from from doing youtubing and um, podcasting and, and all that kind of stuff is that there are a very significant amount of people who um don't have that and ha- and have grown up in in quite toxic and uh, difficult environments and I, th- I think that those those are the people that that need the, the sort of things that we're trying to push. I mean, policies and stuff that we're trying to push into society the most. It's not for, um, for example. I mean, to some extent, it could be for me and you, and and for everybody in the autistic community. But I feel it's mostly for those people who don't really have a voice and don't really have like the the confidence and and all of that. It really breaks my heart to see comments, you know, from people who are really finding it tough. So, yeah, you said that you were diagnosed quite late in your life and that you sort of looked back on your memories and sort of delved into that a little bit and tried to process them. Could you give us some examples of the type of thing that you did once you got a diagnosis? Well, it wasn't really sort of an active process. My brain just... um... I am probably, I'm on the fence about getting a diagnosis, but I, I most likely have ADHD, a sort of inattentive type. And so my brain would just be like, hey, remember that time in school when you went absolutely, do you swear on this show? Or, <laughs> well, you know, uh, when, um, when I... You can use light, light swear, words. swear words. you know, Like hell and damn, hell you and can do damn, those. I will use them. <laughs> um, but, you know, basically I had a meltdown, but I didn't know it was a meltdown. Mm. So it's just like, Remember when you were in school and you were in the queue for, or you were trying to get into lunch early and that, that um, you know, uh, the, uh, the teacher wouldn't let you in and you basically just had a complete meltdown and got into trouble. That was a meltdown. That was an autistic meltdown. And so instead of thinking, why did I act that way? Why am I like this? I don't understand myself. I just, I just snapped out of nowhere. That's how it seemed to me at the time. But looking back on it, I can see, okay, well, I was hungry and my blood sugar level was probably low at the time. And I was in the cafeteria, which had fluorescent lights and lots of Mm -hmm. noise. And so it's that's just one example of the way that, uh, you know, my brain throws me up a memory from my past and goes, hey, what about this memory that you didn't understand at the time? What do you think about that now? (laughs) And I go, hmm, okay, well, through the lens of autism these things make sense. They didn't make sense back then. And that was why it was so hard growing up undiagnosed because life didn't make sense to me. I didn't make sense to me. And it's only now that I can put things together and, and, and look back and, and see that I acted completely, in some ways, completely rationally in every situation as to how you would expect an autistic person, an autistic person to react in those situations. I think like um my my obviously my experience is is a little bit different because um I I was diagnosed about 10 years old mm-hmm. so it was I mean it was wasn't uh, early per se con- in comparison to to some of the people that I know who sort of diagnosed when they were like 4 or 5 or 6 mm-hmm. um but throughout secondary school I I guess knowing that I was autistic gave a little bit of a understanding to sort of my anxiety and Mm -hmm. meltdowns and stuff. I think most of the, God, the wind is going. I was going to say, are you torturing a cat there or something? (laughs) (laughs) It's going crazy. Oh, that doesn't go on for much too longer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
What was I going to say? Yeah, uh, I think most of the the things that I sort of re- reflected back on was the sort of some nuanced sort of differences that I had during school. So like in social interactions and situations where um, I was relatively quite confused and 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 all that. It was I think a lot of the sort of looking back on things and reflecting was after I learned more about autism in my adult life and then obviously look back on my, my past and, and dissected the, uh, the issues that I had. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. If just because you get a diagnosis as a child or as a teenager doesn't necessarily mean that you will understand or learn much or much good information about autism. And that's something that you kind of have, you're left, left to your own devices almost, aren't you? Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, it's it's hard to to learn about autism when you when you've got when you're in school because it's it's like for throughout school you you you're constantly trying to analyze situations and make sure that you're safe and you've got to study and you've got the whole routine of school and then after school you're sort of drained and your battery's empty yeah. so it's it's like it gives no time for you to actually look back on things and reflect yeah. But, you know, in adulthood, I guess, um, when I started going to uni and stuff, um, I had a little bit more time to um, think about stuff and sort of reflect on things, which was quite helpful, I think. So fr- uh, from our previous emails, you told me that you uh, identified as being a demisexual. Mm-hmm. As I said, a lot of listeners, maybe, you know, that may be quite a new term for them. Could you explain what it is and how you came to realise that you were demisexual? It's only something that I've heard about relatively recently, and I think I probably I think I probably came across a YouTube video. I find YouTube has been very the algorithm has been very helpful in uh, offering me interesting videos related to my own life. Um, but basically, demi demisexual demi means half, so you can think of it as kind of like halfway onto the asexual spectrum. Um, although I wouldn't say that I am asexual. So what it what it essentially means um, is that it takes you a long time to develop sexual attract sexual attraction to a person. You you might not do it very often. Uh, it might be just a handful of people in your life that you've ever been sexually attracted to, and it's usually after having a very close bond, developing a very close bond or friendship with someone. So the whole kind of uh, dating setup is not very conducive to allowing demisexual people to really develop good relationships because Mm -hmm. it's not, that's not the right situation. You know, a lot of people um, will go out on dates with someone and go, Oh yeah, I found, I found them pretty attractive. Um, They were, and, and for me, I just, I didn't have that experience. So it was actually quite difficult not knowing this part about me growing up because I basically spent I don't know 15 years thinking that there was something wrong with me um and I'm I might have heard about asexuality but that seemed like something very different from from what I was feeling which was just it just was the very it had to be very particular and very right for me to to feel that kind of sexual attraction and the thing about mm-hmm. demisexuality is it doesn't, it's got nothing to do with whether you're attracted to men or women. You can be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or straight and be demisexual. And, you know, it's also not got anything to do with your gender identity. So it's kind of something that, that is more about how you experience sexual attraction to anyone more than about who it's, who it's to. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously demisexuals vary, you know, we're not, we're not all the same. I'm not deeply embedded. I don't think there is, I don't know if there's much of a demi community, but I've, I've met a lot of autistic people who are also demisexual. Um, I guess we kind of express the same, uh, is bafflement a word? Bafflement? We're all a bit, yeah, confused <laughs> at how people... I like that word. You know, because society, especially these days, the culture is very much like, you know, this sort of, well tinder culture or like reality shows Mm -hmm. like everybody's kind of sleeping with everybody and getting in their pants immediately and 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 the thing is though like I spent a long time like I wanted to do that it wasn't that I had a moral objection that's the thing that people 
often don't understand. This isn't about like, oh, you're just a classy lady or something. Like, I'm really not a classy lady. This isn't about that. It's just I don't I don't feel that until something much more profound has happened. And that's not saying that I'm kind of like better than anyone or anything like that. It's just something that I don't feel until a particular point. And I may never feel it towards most people. I mean, I could probably count on, I don't know, one or two hands, the amount of people that I've actually been really genuinely attracted to. And that's including celebrities. <laughs> you know, like people <laughs> when I was, especially when I was younger, actually no, Leonardo DiCaprio was my very first crush, but like, uh, I still don't think I felt sexual attraction towards him. I just thought I really liked him, you know, but so, yeah. and, and I think most teenage girls, especially, they will feel a level of sexual attraction towards actors, celebrities or something. And I just sort of didn't with, with, a, with a few exceptions. Mm. And I mean, now I'm going on to my mid thirties and I it's still, I'm, I'm not racking up the number of men that I'm, that I've ever been attracted to. It's kind of, still a very very small number luckily one of those is my husband luckily for him at least <laughs> hooray <laughs> i um the reason why i got in contact uh contact with you and uh, wanted to talk about demisexuality is because uh, when i was in in thailand i saw i was introduced to um asexuality because i think that there was a point at which because when we're in Thailand, obviously we were doing research and we were doing work and stuff, but sort of on the the off weeks, you know, when we had some time, a lot of my friends were sort of very much into like the party kind of side to mm. life, I guess. So so it, I did sort of go out quite a lot. And I was just confused because I, I've, I've had this, this thing that, that, that happened that has happened um, a few times sort of going on so on that on nights out and stuff and i really don't feel any any need or want to to engage with mm -hmm. anybody in that way or at least uh, you know uh, i didn't uh, at those times and it's um and my friends sort of made quite a lot of comments about it it's like why why are you doing anything with this this girl like she's she's attracted to you in this way or or, or whatever and I don't know it just it just sort of puzzled me a bit so I, I sort of did a little bit more reading into it into asexuality and stuff and I thought hey you know maybe I'm asexual um and then obviously I read sort of the a spectrum and had a look at what that was about and demisexuality seemed to be quite sort of congruent with with my mindset on on these types of things I guess it sort of goes up and down I guess like I'm I never feel the need to just you know have any sort of relations in that way with with strangers but you know that the, the sort of baseline attraction that that I could have with somebody it was is up to a limit you know like I needed to have some sort of talk I needed to talk to them and and develop some form of bond or or connection with them before having any any types of those feelings. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it 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 was very much like uh, that, but I think to the extreme. I mean, this isn't just about not wanting to, I don't know, be with strangers because I can completely understand that majority of the people probably aren't aren't like that. But but it's even you know you've dated someone for a few months and maybe you've even been intimate with them, but you still don't feel anything and they're, they're the ones one of the few people that you can stand um then it starts to be like okay well is there a part of me that i'm not un understanding fully because i think that's the difficult bit is is you're kind of viewing things through society's lens of how appropriate your feelings are and how appropriate your your dating yeah. world is and you get a lot of mixed messages from society especially as a woman you know it's like you know, be available, but not too available. And that that's a, that's a fine line. But in terms of, yeah. you know, your feelings, it's like, okay, well, you, you date someone, you get to know them a little bit, you date them for a few months. And, and then at that point, you know, you can, you can move forward with your relationship. Um, but what happens if you just never feel that way? It really starts to make you think, even though you want a relationship, it makes you feel very different. And, and some of the comments, I did do a video on this last year and, and 
I thought I explained it quite well because I notice a big difference between the way that me and my peers were. I mean, I had some friends and they, they would go from relationship to relationship kind of thing, you know, the serial, what are they called? Serial monogamists. Um, and I just thought, where are you finding all these people that you like this much? You know, how can you be attracted to all these people? I just, I couldn't get, I, I didn't understand it. And even the, the people that I liked, it was never like, I was never really super attracted to them until, and it, and it wasn't really just like, oh, you have to get to know them a little bit. It's, it's more than that. It was like, I have to have a really deep, oh, what's the opposite of superficial, uh, like a, a profound connection. Like we, we had to have delved into the intricacies of our own minds and connected in that way uh, and have be completely understood and have these sort of experiences. Um, and as you can imagine, that comes across a little bit intense when you are <laughs> on the dating scene. So I probably yeah. probably scared mm-hmm. some people off in my time. I, gu- I guess it is, it is very much like a uh, de- generational thing, you know, with the sort of cultures and stuff, because I'm, I'm mm-hmm. 23. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit younger. And I think, you know, as, as more generations are coming up, it's, it feels very much like um, everything's getting a, a lot more sexualized, I guess. It is, it is difficult, especially with dating. I wouldn't, I, I don't think I'd class, class myself as a, as a demisexual. I think there are aspects of me that would um, lead me to, you know, may, maybe not in, engage with the norm, I guess, with, with dating. But then that's kind of, you reach the intersection of, of sort of sexuality and, and autism in a way, because so much of, yeah. of um, dating behavior and social norms ties into, into autism or, um, or Asperger's. I don't actually know how you refer to yourself. I'm sorry, I should have asked. No, it's fine. I, I usually refer to myself okay. as being autistic, really. <laughs> but you know that that um, intersection of um how you relate to people um that you're attracted to and the kind of the socially appropriate way to go about that i think that 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 sexuality and autism overlap so much and and i think possibly that's why you see so many autistic people who are lgbt plus um or you know um, gender non-conforming or, or something like that because what other people do isn't as important to us doing things the cert- that certain way isn't as important yes yeah I, I definitely think we're, we're more of the type to um, figure out the social rules and, and what we're comfortable with rather than sort of trying to push ourselves to adjust to something that we don't understand yeah. or don't believe in um, I think there is, there is a lot of aspects to that. Just to give give everybody an idea of what the sort of uh, the asexuality spectrum is about, it's pe- someone can be asexual but still want a romantic relationship with somebody, and someone can be sexual but not want a romantic relationship with somebody, and that's it's sort of like a uh, from what I've seen, it's sort of like a a grid so like you've got one line sort of an x y axis kind of thing so you've got you've got these terms aromantic and asexual and depending on what what you feel and what you want to do um you can sort of fall anywhere on that sort of spectrum um and there's there's a lot of terms and i think if i was to properly sort of go through all of them there are like there are things like uh, gray sexual, lift sexual, ace flux, or reciprosexual. Yeah, fr- from from the statistics and stuff that I've looked at, it does seem that there is quite a high link between sort of falling somewhere on the asexuality spectrum and autism, from what I've seen. And why why do you think that is? I think that a part of it might also be to do with uh, your preference for touch and physical contact. You know, autistic mm. people famously don't like hugs. I actually do like hugs, but they've got to be really tight ones. I hate these sort of like little, what are they called? Well, you know, like the wet fish equivalent <laughs> yeah, of a yeah. hug. 
um uh, and that yep, sort of thing yep. and and so if you are <laughs> autistic and like let's say i don't know picky about the way that you're touched that's that's going to have an impact on on your sexuality and and all that and and so it's kind of it's very hard to in your own mind sort through okay well is this a preference that I, I don't like being touched. Is this sort of neurological or is it cultural or is it just my sort of hardwired sexuality? Is is sexuality hardwired? I don't I don't necessarily think so. For me to to enjoy being touched by someone, I have to be close to the person. So n- not just in a sort of um, sexual way, but just, you know, you know how some people are just when they talk to you, they touch your arm or something. I really don't like that. It really oh, uh, people yes. do it a lot more oh, to me. Or the shoulder. Sort of like. I don't know. I, you can't imagine anybody doing that to like a tall, muscular man. I think, but um, I really... they do it to me. <laughs> they do it to me. Yeah, I'm six foot three, and the... but they, they still they still do it, especially when they know that I'm autistic, which is a little bit of a difficulty. I think like a lot of people, um, just sort of something that I came across on Instagram, um, saying that when autistic people are younger people view them as being very mature for their age but as we get older pe- people for some reason view us as being immature yeah, for totally. our age. no that's no that's totally it and uh, I was exactly the same like around my peers at school I was just like why are you guys being so immature like this like why do you need to act like this and now like baboons yeah yeah exactly um and now um when I spend time with people my age I'm like oh my god guys like how have you managed to age so much like mentally age because I still sort of now I feel more like a teenager than I did when I was a teenager it's sort of like a psychological Benjamin Button or something I don't know (laughs) (laughs) oh I love that my dad makes a lot of jokes about Benjamin Button, so oh, yeah. that's just tickled me. Yeah. Do you know what it actually said in my? Uh, I, I find it really funny how this was in my um, diagnostic report. You know that they give you when they say congratulations, you're autistic. It was just like she looks somewhat younger than her than her age, and I'm like, why is that relevant? It's not like I was wearing. I don't know. I don't even know what young people wear these days. But like you know, I was. I felt like I was dressing pretty normally i don't know what warranted and this was before i even had pink hair um (laughs) yeah so yeah i think there is something about autistic people seeming young but i think it's also like we we don't we're not bound by social confines in in what's appropriate to act and oh now you're now you're a mother you need to cut your hair a certain way and and look like the rest of the mums so yeah it's it's kind of like a bit more free I suppose, free to to do whatever because I'm not going to fit in anyway, so why not have pink hair? I get that. I get that. I do. I never feel a need to um, dress for, for my age. I, I just, if I see something that I like or a look that I like, then I'll, I'll try and achieve that look or I'll, I'll try and buy those clothes that that suit my personality the most it's never oh should i really be wearing this i'm a little bit too you know too old or too young too to be old and 23 like oh my goodness no, <laughs> just you wait no, mister no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um but oh but going well, back I... to your original question about um uh, talking about like why do you think that there is an intersection between sort of the asexuality and um mm-hmm and autism i think also i don't yeah. know if you've heard the term alex alexithymia um, yeah which is the difficulty understanding emotions exactly so it's kind of like you don't recognize or understand your own emotions like you if you you know you're feeling something but you can't quite label it like you don't know you're feeling sad or whatever and and then that's pretty yeah. common for autistic people and i think that 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 contributes that contributes if you're used to kind of um an overly analytical look at your own feelings, um, something mm-hmm. like sexual attraction to somebody, it's very hard to analyze that one, isn't it? I guess, yeah, as well, even even more so in the first instant. Yeah. I, you have I to feel it, even don't now, you? It's not yeah, something that you You think. have to feel it to an intensity. Yeah. Like, it has to be... I, f- I found that I, I don't... I find it very difficult to sort of pick up those background emotions 
it has to be extremely sort of intense and and strong for me to um, notice them, I guess. But this is like the thing, anything. even though when, when I first met my husband, I barely noticed him because um, <laughs> I'm sure he'll appreciate this. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it was in a, um, a, a crowded, a crowded place. There were lots of people there. It was noisy. There was so much going on. So I met him, but it was like I, I didn't have enough um, concentration. Maybe is the right word. You know, it's like, yeah because i'm so sensitive to my surroundings in that way to noise and to visual visual noise as well you know like i'm noticing the details on people's shirts or buttons or the the way that they've done their hair or something like that like my attention is all over the place in in these situations so i mean gosh when did i meet i met my husband in in october and it, we didn't start going out until the following july i think um mm. so you you you're sort of quite good friends for a while. Yeah, I mean, well, it was mostly it was mostly kind of online because we weren't living in the same city, but um you know, but but in that point we we had got to know each other to quite a deep level, you know, we had been talking on uh you you probably don't remember this, I don't know, but MSN Messenger was the the thing. No, I know. Back in yeah. the day, you know, <laughs> before before I don't even know what people do on these days. Um, Snapchat. Yeah, well, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we, you know, we'd been talking pretty much every day, and and so we we knew each other quite well, and we became very very close. Um, and and so actually, our first date, we went on holiday together, <laughs> very which nice. sounds ridiculous. It's just like, hey, should we just go on holiday together? Okay. Um, it was so it was basically just like we we got to the point we we saw who the other person really was and then we went on holiday and i was like well don't try any funny business you know let's we need a twin room for sure but uh it yeah it was only on that holiday that and you know i it was just just the two of us there wasn't a lot of distraction and then i was like oh i i really like him and everyone was like yeah didn't you know no <laughs> i didn't I really didn't. I I thought I thought he was really really cool, but then it was only after I'd had that experience being on a holiday. It was just the two of us, and and it was like it was like something just clicked in my head, and then I was like, I really like him. It's almost like a trigger moment, you know, that helps you realize. And I think a lot of that is related to alexithymia, not understanding the relationship between you, you know your feelings and then being able to put a put a label on it. Yeah, I get that. I've I've tried to explain sort of the the emotions and and stuff, and I find it quite difficult to. There's no sort of standard in my head to uh, what point you know what, uh, what level of intimacy I'm I'm in. It just it seems to my my level of intimacy seems to progress very 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 cautiously and slowly because it's like I, I'm not sure what I feel and then I'm not sure. You know, I have to sort of analytically analyze and and think about all the good char- good characteristics and the the bonding moments that we have, and then sort of sort of approach it in a little bit of like a scientific method kind of oh, way. Oh yeah, definitely. I totally um, do that as well. <laughs> and it it does make me feel a little bit like a little bit like sort of like a robot, I guess. Yeah. But it's it's not like I don't feel those things. It's just that. Um, I can't perceive them in in, an, in enough clarity to act on them um, in sort of like an instant, I guess. Well, I guess that that sort of links into sort of like the next question, and because because of that that sort of um, snap snap decisions and sort of being uh, romantically impulsive. What are the the most common problems that face people who are demisexual in the dating arena? Well. I mean, I think number one problem is that it's not a very widely heard of or or commonly used term. And I think not knowing that about me was the hardest thing because I was trying to make myself be normal as a, as to what I thought it would be. And of course, this ties in so much with, with my feelings about not knowing I was autistic as well, but not knowing that yeah. demisexuality... And as a teenager, I probably I don't think I knew anything about asexuality. And so... 
looking for explanations of why you're not like everybody else. Um, this, is, this is from a sort of dating perspective. And I had, I had some friends at school who were gay and they were kind of going through that. And I was like, am I, am I a lesbian? Because I don't feel attracted to, to most men. And of course, it never occurred to me that to be a lesbian, you, can't, like, you have to be attracted to women instead. But it was like, but I'm not attracted to men. Does that make me gay? It was a very, well, you know, the 90s was like, there's still quite a lot of homophobia, even if it's not quite so overt, but definitely growing up with, with like, you know, you're so gay was an insult. And of course, now that insult is you're so autistic, um, which is great, isn't it? You know, we've really moved on as a society. But sorry, what's the question? The the things that demisexual people <laughs> struggle with. Um, I yeah, think dating, in, in the dating arena. Dating in general. I mean, like even if you know that you're that you're you're demi, it's um it's very hard for people to other people to understand that. I mean, the comments that that I get on that video are just like you're completely normal. This is just what women are like. And I wonder if it's like hmm, maybe like incels making some of these comments. This is what women are like. No women want sex and. You know, it's like, well, maybe not if you like that, but it's amazing the amount of people who don't believe me when I'm like, this is the term that has described me. It's described why I'm completely different to everybody else. And people turn around and go, well, you're just like everybody else. And I'm going, no, 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 I'm, I'm not. This is what I'm trying to tell you, you know? So it's, it's very frustrating because people don't think it's a real thing. And it's just like, yeah. I, you know, there is, there's no with sexuality it's an identity thing so so people have to take your word for it and people have to believe you and, and people find that very hard even with an autism diagnosis i still got people telling me i'm not autistic and i'm like okay but so so how on earth should i prove this to you how would you even prove that you are demisexual to someone i don't i don't even know but but it's me telling you my experience and rather than saying oh i just want to be special i want a special word for what i am it's like well okay, it's maybe not very widely understood, but this is a term that is the closest that I've come to explaining how I feel and my experience with with dating and with, you know, sexual attraction and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so it's it's very, I think society makes makes it very hard and it would have been really helpful to have understood this when I was single and when I was sort of dating or trying to because Dating never went well for me, as you can imagine, being undiagnosed autistic. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, I didn't know why, which made it so much harder. Because, you know, dating culture these days, even in the last, well, pretty much since the advent of online dating, things have really changed to be much more fast paced and kind of like throwaway. Yeah, yeah. People have got a lot more opportunities to talk to people and, and to date people so it's like if if they don't reach this impossible impossibly high threshold of um what they deem to be a, a connection or or a spark or something in the first date then they're just going to look for someone else they're not going to sort of give you the time to to get to know you rather than Exactly. You know, it's making a snap decision. Yeah, and I think this is obviously this uh this impacts autistic people as well because I mean, I'm unless I meet someone that I have an absolute immediate connection and spark with, and those are usually actually also autistic and ADHD people. Um, <laughs> it really it takes me a long time to open up to people, and and so for a lot of my my well, especially early twenties, you know, I was masking so heavily, so I was kind of like, okay, who do you want me to be? You know, um, yeah. spending all my energy trying to mask. Uh, trying to be the person that I thought I was supposed to be, to be liked and to be accepted. And it just got, it got me nowhere. You know, um, I, I, I wouldn't even say I had failed relationships. I, I, I failure to launch was really the, uh, the problem I had. Um, I never got anywhere with, with anyone really, apart from my husband. So it was just as well I did, I suppose, <laughs> looking back on it, a bit depressing. In In any situation where, you are the minority in a certain mindset it's going to be more difficult to find people who are like-minded and or at least at least open-minded enough to listen to you because i think like well, one of the questions that i did want to ask you was as as we said like people don't think some people don't think demisexuality should be a thing 
Because I mean, one of the arguments that I've seen a lot is that it's not too dissimilar to having a low sex drive, mm. um, which I don't agree with, obviously. No. But what what are your thoughts on these comments? Well, having a low sex drive is completely different to being to only being sexually attracted to a small amount of people, because if you're with that right person, you can have a very high sex drive because you are attracted to them. I mean, you could also have a low sex drive and be demisexual, but the two things are completely separate. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I spend a lot of time kind of analysing and thinking about things. And there are some people who may not have even thought that being sexually attracted to people in some way is, is kind of distinct from having a sex drive of your own. But I think that's the same with with asexual people is that they do have sex sometimes, you know, it, and so people find that very difficult to to kind of understand. And so I think maybe just to understand it, people need to stop trying to make everything fit neatly and just listen to people about their own experiences, you know, because like I said, I, I well, I cannot possibly speak for every, every demisexual's preferences or anything like that we're we're all different we might have things in common but at the end of the day we're all going to experience demisexuality slightly differently mm-hmm. so you can get an idea of what it's about but there there might be some demisexuals with a a, a low sex drive for sure uh, or with a high sex drive and and so it's yeah it's it's difficult to talk about i don't and i don't normally talk about sexuality a lot because i'm so busy talking about autism Oh, you know, yeah. but uh, it's it's definitely interesting, and it's and it's to be autistic, you go through a diagnosis process, and you get that kind of stamp of approval, which mm-hmm. isn't enough for somebody, some people, but it's still there, and yeah, everything to do with sexuality is completely self-reported. There is no there's no test for sexuality, is there? No, apart from maybe self tests on, on on the internet or something, <laughs> but. So it's it's very much like you you just have to listen to people and when people tell you that this is the way they feel or this is the term that that describes how they feel the best then I don't know believe them I guess <laughs> Well I suppose it's I think a lot a lot of people are very quick to assume that these types of things are you know for example just for sort of saying oh look at me like i'm part of this small minority of people just just tr- trying to trying too hard to try and describe yourself with a term but it's not it's not about that from what i've seen it's just about clarity i guess yeah and understanding understanding yourself yeah. and having having a, a term or a label you know some people are so opposed to labels but but learning just learning about the the word demisexuality was so empowering for me because it was like oh it's a thing it's not just something that's wrong with me and I never knew how to describe it it's a thing and that's important and that's the same with autism actually because all this time I've been internalizing all of these traits and thinking well I'm desperately bad at this and I'm I'm this and this and this and I'm a horrible person and I'm terrible at this and why can't I do this and that is not good for your mental health. But the minute I realized, wait a minute, this this is autism, th- things started getting better. And it's not like things are easy, but having... It grounds you. Exactly. It grounds you. You know why. Um, and having a term that you can use to describe that to other people is powerful. Cool. Just sort of round up what we've talked about. Would you like to give us sort of three main points or or things that you want people to take away from the podcast right three main points so demisexuality is is really a term for having a limited amount of sexual attraction to people and something that only develops as as we've we've said after going through a significant bonding or after becoming extremely close to them it's a thing it's a real thing and you can tell me that this is how all people are, but this is not how people are. Otherwise, they would behave differently. <laughs> so it is, it's a real thing. Yes, this is my lived no, experience. Um, that's two things. Um, and I guess just, you know, if, if you think, oh my gosh, this sounds like you just, you know, go down the research rabbit hole and, and 
look into the the ace spectrum and maybe look into aromantic if that if you think that sounds like you um you know research demisexuality just read about it until you find something that that fits because if you've always felt like everybody else is kind of different and you don't know why there's there's probably a term for it on the internet somewhere these days yes (laughs) that's the joy of living in 2020 (laughs) there aren't many joys to 2020 but seriously everything's on the internet now have you got a uh, last point for us um check out my youtube channel <laughs> oh yes of course yep. yeah i don't talk much about demisexuality i've done i've done one video but it's mostly about autism uh neurodiversity uh i'll be doing a little bit more on executive functioning in the next few months i've got a little mini series planned for that and i'm also sort of well i I, I constantly tell people it's okay to self-identify as autistic and, and I'm sort of on the fence about whether it's okay for me to do that with ADHD. So I'm kind of in the middle of deciding whether I want to pursue a diagnosis of, of ADHD as well. So I'm hoping to do some content about that in the future because that's a very interesting one, the, the intersection of autism and ADHD. So your your YouTube channel is Yo Samdi Sam. Yo Samdi Sam, yes. Uh, you can probably type in a misspelling of it, and it will will still come up on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's actually oh, yeah. it's a, a a childhood nickname of mine. I like it. And you have your social medias as well. Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram at Yo Samdi Sam, and I kind of do Twitter, but um, not so much. There's I don't, I don't put much interesting stuff on there, so. <laughs> I'm just like, don't follow me on Twitter. It's boring. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I I definitely think you should go check out um, Sam's uh, YouTube channel. It's 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 grow it's grown very very quickly, and it's there's a lot of good videos on there about all sorts of different topics. And as uh, as you said, Sam, like it put one out every week. Yep. Yeah, I try to I try to get one out. weekly and then i do live streams every month or so and uh and yeah it's a it's a a really nice little community of of viewers i mean people say that youtube can be very toxic and that is the case you know on the comments on on my larger videos but but the core the core community is just uh really great um so i i just i just love like chatting to chatting to viewers and and stuff like that so yeah, I hope that your listeners will become my my listeners. <laughs> um, yes, you steal them over. Exactly. Well, they can listen to both. <laughs> yeah, listen to both of exactly. us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's let's go for the last question, which is always a an interesting one. Um, what does autism mean to you, Sam? To me, autism is about having a different perspective on the world from from the majority and that comes from a neurological difference but your perceptions of the world inform everything we we are all you know meats brains encased in meat sacks uh trying to sense our way through life aren't we and some of us the autistic ones are just sensing things a little bit differently and and i think from a very basic level our perception through our senses informs a lot of our social behaviors and and everything else so for me it's it's like very autism is like the the very basic layer of of who i am and and all of my other behavior comes out of that and being autistic in a majority neurotypical world sort of you develop coping mechanisms um and and so on so i hope that was meat sack i like that term to describe like my body me. yeah <laughs> yeah me too you seem to you seem to um to like a lot of uh those sort of um terms i uh, i picked up on something on your demisexuality video which is uh, monkey lust monkey lust yeah that's how it feels yeah for everyone else i absolutely i love it it's great monkey lust <laughs> and this is the thing you know go uh, growing up as a teenager and in my in my 20s that's that's how it seemed like everyone was to me until i understood yeah. that i was actually different well you've got to, you've got to sort of take those um um those things and make them a little bit humorous don't you or else you sort of get caught up in um sort of the more negative aspects of it i guess oh definitely <laughs> yeah you can you can re- really is... feel sorry for yourself being autistic and demisexual like there is room for that but um i think humor humor is a coping mechanism to me so uh 
that's been the way that I've made sense of it all has been through humor. Well, thank you for listening to us, you meat sacks. <laughs> <laughs> brainy, brainy meat sacks. <laughs> you wonderful meat sacks with a lovely little neurological difference or, or just a general uh, neurology. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you want to check out the 40 Audio podcast, you can find it on Spotify, Anchor, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, we think I've got about I think up until this point, I've done about 18 episodes. So we've got a lot more to come out, and this is probably going to be going out a little bit later. But um, you can also check out my YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth, on YouTube, of course, and some of my social medias, which is Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Asperger's Growth. And of course, the Asperger's in Society documentary, which has recently got quite quite a lot of views, and I'm, I'm very happy with the support and the feedback that the autistic community is is giving me and it's got a website www.aspergesinsociety.com go check it out if you uh, fancy looking at some behind the scenes footage thank you very much for coming onto the podcast sam well, thank you I for really having appreciate me. it no it's been fun have you enjoyed have you enjoyed it yeah yeah it's always uh it's always nice to chat with people because you know it's it gets a little lonely doing youtube to be honest just talking to a camera so it's it's always nice to yeah. to talk to other people who kind of do other creative things with regards to with regards to autism I'm looking forward to watching the documentary i actually didn't didn't uh didn't get a chance to see it yet so yeah i'd be very um eager to see what your your thoughts of it is Thank you, everybody, for listening to us ramble about autism. <laughs> it's always a very therapeutic for myself, and I hope that you've got something out of this episode. Have a great day, and I'll see you later, Meat Sacks. Yeah, bye, Meat Sacks. <laughs> Love you guys, really. <laughs> bye. <laughs>